originating application 318 of 2022, summons 63 of 2023, Deputy Payments Private Limited. Very good morning. Let me and Mr. Zoom allocation first before we begin. So parties are all reminded there is to be no unauthorized photography or recording in any form and no determination of any photographs or recording of these proceedings. And only those counsel or persons notified to the court should be present at each location and parties should treat these proceedings as they would a physical hearing. So for the applicants, you have uh, Mr. Danny Ong, Mr. Planoto, Ms. Nomi Lim, and I believe you have a practice trainee, Mr. Craig Chua. Is that correct? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Very good morning. That All is right. Morning. All right. Thank you. And we have various attendees in the courtroom. Let me just check the physical courtroom first. All right. Thank you. All right. Before we begin uh, with the applicants, uh, I have been receiving a number of letters from various account holders uh, over the last uh, couple of weeks. And I think uh, most of them have expressed concerns or unhappiness about the company and the moratoria. We will get to the uh, substance of these concerns this morning, and I will hear out the applicants as well as those of you who are present today. However, before we do that, I think it's important for me to highlight a few things about uh, the moratorium process and what can or cannot be done. So to reiterate, the application today is for an extension of the moratorium, which had been previously given last year. And what the moratorium does is to stop proceedings being commenced or continued against the company. So it gives the company a kind of uh, shield or safe haven for a period of time. And the objective is to allow the company to try to put together a plan that will be put normally to a vote by the creditors. And if approved, then the plan will usually have its own uh, separate moratoria and uh, of course, there'll be voting and uh, that sort of thing, and there'll be supervision by the courts at that point. But that's only once a plan is applied for and once a meeting is scheduled. In the meantime, all that is in place is that shield against proceedings being commenced or continued. So what I also need to emphasize is that the role of the court at this stage of the proceedings is actually not uh, very broad. It's quite limited. It's really primarily just whether or not, uh, whether to decide whether or not any extension should be given. Uh, I would personally think that it is also possible for the court to decide to remove the shield. But the law in Singapore, the test in Singapore for any shield or moratoria being extended or continued isn't that strict. In very broad terms, what is required really is that the company has some sort of plan being developed in broad terms, and they're able to describe something that would seem to be sufficient to be potentially capable of gaining support uh, from the creditors. So at this point, they don't really have to show that they cross the 75% threshold or any major threshold. Of course, if uh, it is clear that the level of support is very, very low, and it's not likely that it will shift with whatever is proposed, then the courts would probably remove the shield or moratorium. But otherwise, the standard or threshold for allowing the moratorium to continue is not that high. Uh, but what uh, we have actually expressed in various cases is that the longer you ask for, the more extension, number of extensions you keep asking for, the more skeptical we will get. We would like to see a plan being developed within a decent amount of time uh, and to basically make sure that it is uh, 
likely to be accepted or acceptable to the creditors. So that is the scope of what can be done in these proceedings. I have to emphasize that my powers are not quite the same as what you might have it before a US judge in a chapter 11 proceeding. What we have in place is somewhat similar, but it's not exactly the same. For those of you who have asked me to intervene directly in the company, that is generally not possible under Singapore law in the moratorium proceedings. All I can do is to extend or not extend the moratorium. I can, of course, indicate to the company that uh, if certain things are not done or put in place, I would be reluctant to extend the moratorium. But uh, as I mentioned, I'm always guided by the state of the law, which is really that the threshold for extension is not that high. They just need to be able to point to some possible plan uh, that may be acceptable to the general run of credit. There's a reasonable plan that will be uh, acceptable to general run of creditors. Out, for those of you who talk or concerned about replacing the management and that sort of thing, that is not what is contemplated under a moratorium framework. The company is basically left to try to put their plan forward to cobble together a plan that will work. We have other procedures that are more interventionist, primarily the judicial management process. Right. In that process, uh, creditors, for example, can apply to the court for the court to appoint someone, usually an insolvency practitioner, normally an accountant by training, to come in and take over the company. Take over the management of the company, they will basically replace the directors and they will run the company uh, with an objective, amongst other things, usually of either trying to put a plan together that will be put to a vote to the creditors, or sometimes just trying to put things in order so that the winding up will be more advantageous and more orderly. So that's the primary uh, alternative in terms of a rescue of the company, the judicial management process. It requires a separate application and there are separate requirements under the law before a judicial manager will be appointed. Uh, the other major alternative or primary alternative for creditors when a company is in trouble uh, is to apply for winding up. You know, of course, uh, that will be something that will be rather drastic because it basically puts a stop to the activities of the company and you will have to see whether the company, what assets will be realized or realizable uh, and what can be obtained Usually it is not uh, very much, but sometimes some creditors would prefer it because they think the liquidator can do a better job in winding up the company, or they think that there's no hope and we might as well get uh, to try to wind up the company and salvage whatever is possible. And sometimes people say that a liquidator might be helpful in investigating the affairs of the company when uh, there's some uh, concerns about what went on in the company. And I should mention that a judicial manager can also perform some of these investigative functions. So what I wanted to outline was really that uh, the moratorium is one particular framework. It may lead to a scheme, but the role of the court is quite limited. The other option would be judicial management where the court appoints a judicial manager and the judicial manager displaces directors, but that requires a separate application. The other major alternative is the liquidation, which is the winding of the company, company ceases to exist, stops trading, and we just try to collect the assets and distribute it out to all the creditors. And we'll have to follow a particular list and theme of uh, distribution, all right? So that's basically uh, what's referred to as bankruptcy in uh, the US. Now, whether you use a moratorium or judicial management, the I, one, possi one possibility or rather one possible outcome would be that a scheme is put together, a plan for the resuscitation of the company. The scheme process is technically a separate process from the moratorium. Moratorium just puts a stop or it's just a shield to prevent proceedings, lets the company cobble together 
the scheme, and then there are processes in place for basically the company to try to get the approval of the creditors, and that requires the calling of a meeting, voting by the creditors, and all that. We are not at that stage yet. The company is basically still trying to put the scheme together, or so they say. All right, so that's where we are. So I understand that a number of you have had concerns about what's going on in the company, uh, have asked me to intervene to replace certain people. I'm afraid I cannot do that. All I can do at this point is to see whether I, uh, whether the company has met the threshold for renewal of the shield or otherwise. It may be that for those of you who are concerned, uh, you really think it's the better option for the company maybe to proceed on some other basis, perhaps by way of judicial management or winding up, but you will have to take legal advice on that and instruct uh, Singapore solicitors. It's not something I would advise you to try to conduct in person, All right? So you have to instruct Singapore lawyers on the viability of any of these applications, which I assume will be resisted by the company, and they will need to make an assessment for you whether it's likely to be successful in an application before the court. All right, so I wanted to outline that uh, to make sure that you understand the scope of the present proceedings and uh, what can be done. Of course, in these present moratorium proceedings, I will try, I will make sure that there's as much information exchanged or uh, disseminated as far as possible. I will call the company and its directors out if there are any concern. But at the end of the day, as I said, the test I need to apply is whether there is any possibility of a reasonable plan being put together that will be acceptable to the general run of the creditors. And basically that the whole thing is being done in good faith. All right, now at this point, let me just check through. I think there were some things coming up in chat. Uh, uh, all right, for those of you who are viewing, uh, I will allow uh, some of you, those of you who want to speak uh, briefly to respond later and you'll be proposed to panelists subsequently. Uh, we're doing it this way so I can control the number speaking at each point. Uh, there's another question from, so that was in response to Mr. Murray. Uh, Mr. Joshua Matthews, the company is trying to put together a scheme. They are, at this stage, we don't require them to put together a fully detailed scheme. It just needs to be uh, put together in a general form and we assess whether it's likely to be acceptable to the general run of creditors. All right, and Mr. Butmir, I've taken note that you wish to address the court. So basically for all of you who wish to address the court, I will come to that later. I will let the applicant speak first and then I'll come to all of you. All right. All right, uh, Mr. Ong, let's have the uh, applicant's position. If you could summarize where we are right now, please. Yes. Um, I'm grateful for your uh, honest guidance to, to the attendees. Uh, let me just uh, pick up where you're on the left off. Uh, to be clear for the benefit of the attendees, uh, the moratorium extension that we're seeking today is merely to uh, the 21st of April 2023. So it's just an extension for three months. Uh, that extension uh, is is premised on a timetable that has been put forth both in the affidavits and in the submissions, where it contemplates that by mid-February this year, uh, there will be a uh, intended finalization of the term sheet uh, with a fund manager in relation to an alternative restructuring uh, proposal that will be put forth. Uh, upon finalization of the term sheet in mid-February, uh, in March, uh, it is proposed that the explanatory statement for the proposed scheme will be finalized. Um, and then by April 2023, prior to the expiry of the three month period, an application will be brought to your honor for permission to convene a meeting of creditors uh, for purposes of placing that proposed scheme uh, for voting. So that is the timetable uh, and, and the sh relatively short leash, so to speak, that will be afforded and is sought by the company. Uh, the context uh, leading up to this timetable, Your Honour, would recall that uh, from the 
throughout basically the fourth quarter of 2022, uh, discussions were focused primarily on uh, a party called Nexo, who was interested in basically acquiring the, uh, the, the assets and liabilities and the customer accounts across. Um, we had uh, in that fourth quarter received two proposals, an in initial one that was subsequently revised. Um, the unfortunate uh, aspect of the Nexo proposal was that by December 2022, it became quite apparent, uh, two points. Firstly, that the uh, Nexo could not onboard uh, or take on uh, US creditors uh, or US customers of the Vault platform. And those US customers actually account for to about 40 to 50% of uh, uh, value of the debt uh, uh, of, owed to the customers by Vault. Uh, that, that, the implication of that is that, is that if the Nexo deal was put forth, uh, it, there's a good chance that it would be shot down and it would not pass master because of the threshold requirements for voting for 75% in value. Uh, but more importantly, or equally important, Your Honor, is that by December, uh, we had, uh, the company had repeatedly asked for evidence of the financial standings, accounts, solvency, uh, and also requested for an independent solvency assessment to be uh, conducted uh, on Nexo. Um, Nexo never responded to this request. Um, as of 6 December, in fact, there were six US regulatory, regulatory authorities that flagged concerns uh, regarding Nexo's uh, uh, position uh, and actually had commenced investigations, including a suit, civil suit filed by the New York Attorney Gen General against Nexo. Um, so all this made all the more important the question as to uh, the financial standing and solvency and means uh, of, of, of Nexo. Why would it, I mean, it, it is obviously obvious, but, but it is obvious, but let, let me perhaps state it in any event. Uh, the acquisition by Nexo would involve acquiring uh, a few hundred, 200 million of customer, uh, uh, or customer assets as well as the company's assets. Uh, in, and, and then uh, they would assume the liabilities owed to the customers. But obviously, their ability to meet and satisfy those liabilities would entirely be dependent on their solvency and their financial standing. Uh, so it was crucial to verify that. And by December, we still could not get a response. There was nothing uh, forthcoming. Um, just last week, Your Honor, this is exacerbated by the fact that just last week we had learned that the uh, Nexo, which was founded by uh, various Bulgarian founders, had been subjected to uh, Bulgarian prosecutors' raid and investigations uh, as to illegal activities, in particular money laundering, uh, where several billion dollars were, were alleged to have been laundered through the uh, Nexo platform. Um, so that, I think that 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 pretty much validates. Uh, the company's view that uh, the Nexo proposal uh, can't uh, be brought forward further. And uh, all right, if I could stop you at this point, Mr. Ong, yeah. uh, I think I do recall some of the account holders uh, expressing concerns about Nexo early on. So uh, it seems that perhaps this should have been something of concern and perhaps not even pursued early on in the process. It, it seems like a wasted period of several months uh, pursuing this in next row. Yeah, I think that's a fair, 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 fair concern raised. But just to put things in perspective, Your Honor, um, in Q3, uh, that was the due diligence period undertaken uh, by Nexo. Uh, uh, negotiations and discussions started earnest only in Q4, uh, 2022. In the meantime, it's as if it's not as if a plan B was not being developed. Uh, the company, to, with the benefit of uh, Crow's assistance, had actually developed an alternative proposal that involved uh, a reverse Dutch auction whereby the company acquires uh, uh, customer claims. Uh, and on top of that, uh, the setting up of a fund operated by an independent third party uh, reputable fund manager. And in Q4 2022, what had happened was that Crow, together with the management, uh, had been sourcing and been in discussions. Uh, with these potential fund managers, there were about uh, four or five listed, uh, shortlisted, uh, two of whom had, in fact, as of uh, December 2022, uh, met with the COC uh, and made presentations to the COC. Uh, and that was, in fact, on 19 December 2022. 
Um, and then uh, the information regarding the fund management option was also presented uh, by way of circulars, uh, firstly to creditors as of 26 December 2022, followed by a 5th January 2023 town hall, uh, so just uh, a week or two ago, uh, to the creditors. Um, and that town hall, Your Honour, as well as the 26 December circular, uh, actually set out uh, in detail to uh, the creditors uh, the analysis of the ne final next old proposal, uh, the analysis as to the fund management option, uh, as well as the analysis as to uh, a contrast as compared to a liquidation scenario and the uh, yield from uh, liquidation versus uh, the fund management proposal, uh, not, as well as the financial position of the company. Um, so it's not as if the company, together with its advisors, had 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 had, had sat on 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 the next proposal and not explored option. Um, the moment we uh, the the company was 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 having pushback on the uh, 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 provision uh, obtaining of financial information from Nexo, um, the uh, alternative option fund management option was uh, pursued in earnest. Um, so what has happened then is that as of now, Your Honor, uh, the company has had. Uh, re has received two uh, term sheets uh, from uh, two fund managers uh, that has also been presented to the COC uh, and discussed with uh, feedback provided and the advisors and the company are now going back to the fund managers to refine uh, the terms with a view, as I said earlier at the outset, um, obtaining a definitive term sheet uh, as of February 2023. And could you summarize in broad terms the likely returns from these uh, possible investments with the funds? Yes. Uh, funds? So to put things in perspective, and for the benefit of the attendees, this was covered in page 34 of the uh, Crow's uh, circular that was sent on 26 December and presented at the 5th January Town Hall. Uh, the liquidation scenario would involve a yield of 16 to 29 percent uh, cents to the dollar. Uh, the restructuring proposal from uh, in the fund management uh, model under the fund management model uh, would yield a low of 58 and a base of 100 percent. Uh, so that's 16 to 29 in liquidation, 58 to 100 percent in contrast. Under Sorry, the uh, which affidavit would this be in? Uh, Your Honor can look at. Uh, uh, F8 affidavit of uh, Mr. Darshan. Mr. It, Darshan's eighth affidavit. All right, thank you. It is at page 191 of the affidavit. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, and your honor would see at page 191 of that affidavit on the left hand side a uh, comparison of possible recoveries. Mm -hmm. And on the right hand side of the page 191, uh, it this analyzes a uh, time frame for uh, payouts under firstly the restructuring proposal where your honor will see 25%, 25%, 50% in years one to three, equating to 100. And in contrast, so 100% in how many years? Three years. Three years. Yeah. And uh, all right. I, I mean, given the state of the crypto, uh, uh, crypto world right now, wouldn't that be a wee, possibly a bit optimistic? Um, they, there are two, uh, not according to the fund managers, and I think this is where the independence of the fund managers are important. Um, we've, the, the fund, just to uh, highlight, I mean, the profile of the fund managers, we're talking about some of the top uh, liquid fund managers in the world in this digital asset space. Um, and it's been pretty conservative. Uh, they, they're not talking about multiple hundred, few hundred percent returns. Um, the returns uh, in, in, in some cases um, ranges from seven to 10 percent, uh, you know, maybe in their teens. Uh, but by no means are they are the hundred percent recovery premise on a few hundred percent returns, for example. So it's not speculative in that sense. Um, of course, the you know the market could move. Your Honor is quite right. I mean, Bitcoin is at twenty thousand now. It could drop to five thousand. Touch wood, it doesn't. Uh, but those those scenarios would place we say um, would be would place leave the 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 creditors no worse off uh, because in the liquidation scenario, 
uh, that devaluation of the assets will just occur without any possibility or even a reinvestment or trading uh, uh, to, to, to possibly hedge against the debt movement. Uh, whereas with the trading scenario, there is that option to actually implement strategies that will try to manage those risks. You know. All right. Um, so, so that's been deliberated upon by the COC. Uh, it's been disseminated to, to the creditors. Again, once the term sheet is uh, finalized, uh, it targeted for February, then further details would, would arise from that, Your Honor. Um, so those communications uh, were, was last, uh, your, was last uh, sent across to, to the customers, uh, creditors uh, in uh, 5th uh, January, Your Honor via the town hall. All right. Uh, I note from the affidavits uh, and submissions, there have been some uh, concerns by the company about the uh, information being disseminated through, I think, one of the Telegram chats. Telegram. Uh, but you didn't ban the users as such, I hope? Uh, the chat function uh, has uh, been uh, shut down because uh, of this information issue. Uh, the telegram uh, therefore remains a com uh, information channel. Uh, for one way then. One way, yes. But your honor would recall that uh, it was actually, there was an email uh, that was set up whereby uh, creditors, customers could email their questions and concerns. That was sort of set up quite long ago, I think in Q3 uh, 2022. Uh, in addition to, uh, to that, November 2022, following upon some feedback from customers and your honor's guidance, uh, the company had also- uh, uh, All right, hold on a moment. Sorry, could I please uh, alert the users of the chat? This is not for you to chat with each other. If you have concerns, you can raise it. You can ask, you can postulate questions to the court, but no general comments. These are court proceedings. So for those of you who are putting comments to each other, please, please uh, hold off. If anyone, if you keep using it for comments amongst yourselves, I will boot you out. All right? I don't want to do that. I know you're all concerned about your fans, uh, but, don't let's not. I don't want the chat to be used for that function, and this are court proceedings, so you don't chat with each other in that way. Let me be very clear about that. This is my one and final warning. All right, I don't want to boot anyone out. You can raise questions later, but remember, you are in a courtroom. You can have your communications with each other offline. I don't have to see that, but with, please use these. Uh, the web chat function, part of Zoom, to raise things to me that you'd like to speak on about later on, or if you have genuine questions about the process, that's fine, but no comments, uh, no editorial comments, all right? I hope that's understood. And again, later when I come to you for your uh, views, remember you are in the courtroom, all right? So let's bear that in mind. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Thank you, oh. you're Okay. Uh, on the Telegram channel, Your Honor, where we last uh, left off, uh, that was the uh, platform by which uh, misinformation had been circulated that was also used by Nexo to post their open letter to, 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 to creditors. Uh, we had also discovered that users had disguised themselves as creditors and we could not verify uh, were, that they were in fact creditors. So the control uh, function wasn't there. Uh, it was therefore shut down. But nevertheless, Your Honor, two points. Uh, the emails uh, group uh, address remains available and accessible to all creditors, customers uh, to send queries uh, uh, to the company. Uh, those emails upon uh, as of November 2022, following guidance from uh, your honor, uh, are now also automatically forwarded to the COC members so that they as a group uh, can take on board the concerns and raise them at the regular uh, monthly or bi-monthly uh, 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 COC meetings. Uh, for that to be addressed, Your Honor. Uh, so the communication channels are, are still available, albeit not through uh, the Telegram chat, Your Honor. All right. And in terms of the timeline? Uh, in terms of the timeline, Your Honor, the, the timetable has been, has been set out in both the affidavit and the submissions. 
uh, and it's pretty tight. Uh, in fact, by basically contemplates by. End hold, of on, hold on, hold on, hold uh, on. For the last time, I will no inter uh, audience chats, please. You can raise your concerns, as I said, later on. You can put up your hand. This is not for you to discuss amongst yourselves. All right, so I emphasize you have the ability to have other channels. This is really for you to communicate with me. Let me be clear on that. All right, so you can raise your hands later. I will give some ground rules later. Uh, I don't want to stop the chat. All right, so all right, one of you has commented that none of you can see the chats. All right, I think some of us can see it. Uh, but in any event, uh, let's have not had that. And there's no point uh, saying certain comments to me then. All right, so let's uh, stop that for the moment. I will come to you and uh, you can raise your hands. All right. All right, thank you very much. All right. Um, thank you, Yona. Um, in terms back to your honest question as yes. to the timetable, uh, the proposal is uh, the, the timetable is as such uh, mid February 2023, target date for finalization of the term sheet with the fund manager, March 2023, finalization of the explanatory statement for the proposed scheme of arrangement. Uh, for the benefit of the attendees, the explanatory statement essentially uh, is as, as, as it suggests, it ex explanatory notes uh, for uh, as to what the scheme is about, what are the relevant terms of the scheme, what is the framework for it, how does it work, uh, on, on what threshold uh, does it get passed and voted upon, who gets to vote, and so on and so forth, uh, and right. the mix of it. Uh, then by April... All right, so for the record, uh, this is in your submissions? Uh, it's both in our submissions and our affidavit, yes. All right. Um, Could you have a record? I mean, sorry, state it. Uh, oh, it's not in the submission. Uh, the timetable is at paragraph 53, page 28 of the submission. Right, hold, on, hold on a moment. Right, page uh, 28 all right, of submission. Yes, Your Honor. It is also just for uh, completeness at uh, paragraph 42 of the 8th affidavit, the same table. All right. Yeah. Um, so the last item, therefore, will be April 2023. That was when that is when it's contemplated that, that the company will apply to the court for permission to convene a meeting of creditors for purposes of presenting uh, the scheme proposal, the restructuring proposal, uh, and for that to be voted upon at the hearing. Um, and, and for the benefit of the audience, that application to your honor for leave for permission to convene the meeting uh, would involve presenting to the court an outline of the uh, the proposed uh, restructuring plan, uh, the key aspects of it, uh, yeah. and to satisfy your honor that it is uh, it is a legitimate uh, a good faith proposal which has the support of uh, a decent uh, segment of the creditor group. Oh, all right, thank you. All right, uh, anything else in terms of the scheme and timeline? Uh, not in terms of the scheme and timeline, Your Honor, uh, but for the benefit of the attendees, uh, I just wanted to flag that uh, there was uh, some queries raised regarding the financial position of the company. Uh, All right. Yeah. All right. What you can do at this point is if you could uh, respond to the various concerns expressed, and I think, uh, for example, in relation to the CEO and communications and that sort of thing, and then we will run through some of the questions raised for the chat. Uh, by the chat, uh, and then uh, I'll come to the participant, the attendees later. All right. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, very briefly, um, in terms of the engagement with the COC, the COC, if you will recall, uh, is made up of 17 members, uh, 13 of whom are active. Uh, mm -hmm. Since uh, the last hearing in seven, on 7 November 2022, there have been six COC meetings. Uh, between November and January, the last one being uh, in January 2023, uh, whereby both the Nexo proposals as well as the fund management options were discussed. 
Uh, as I mentioned earlier, on 19 December, two shortlisted fund managers had introduced themselves and presented to the COC as well. Uh, in terms of the wider body of creditors, uh, and I touched upon it earlier, uh, they had, uh, pursuant to multiple requests from creditors, uh, the company conducted assessments of its asset liability position as at 14 December 2022 and provided that information as well as uh, key information regarding the Nexo proposal, as well as the fund management option via an email update on 26 December and a 5th January 2023 uh, town hall. Um, as alluded to earlier, um, the, in terms of communications, emails directed to the COC have since November been automatically forwarded to the personal emails of the COC members for consideration. Um, and the company has also engaged with its top 20 unsecured creditors, uh, including introducing them to the fund managers on 21st December 2022. Um, and in terms of uh, uh, the financial position, uh, the company uh, both uh, in its deck and the town hall, uh, the deck of 26 December, as well as at the town hall, presented the asset and liability position. Uh, the company has confirmed on affidavit as before that it has not, uh, it's, it has not made any withdrawals uh, in respect of any of the assets of the company uh, and the funding of the operating expenses, the OPEC thus far, has from time to time been funded purely from uh, funds of uh, injected by the holding company, uh, DeFi Holding. Uh, mm -hmm. There has been concerns uh, raised in relation to uh, uh, whether certain customers were allowed to withdraw. Uh, the management has confirmed on affidavit as well that there has been no such withdrawals. It remains in suspense. Um, there has also been a comment regarding uh, what exactly is the company's exposure to FTX following upon its collapse? Uh, FTX, uh, it, upon its collapse in November 2022, preliminarily, uh, the company's uh, estimation as of January, as reported to at the town hall, was pegged at 8.8 million US. Uh, uh, it, the company has since worked further to source relevant supporting documents to substantiate that uh, the assessment now has been adjusted uh, to 6.4 million US uh, as at 14 December 2022. Uh, there will be potential for fluctuations, obviously, because this is packed to uh, the denomination of the uh, asset that is uh, held with FTX. Um, but for, for the benefit of, of the customers' creditors, uh, the nine affidavit uh, of the company has also set out a table of the net exposure to FTX, uh, which highlights the exact quantities of the cryptos that are held uh, the, and the basis for the valuation and how we've arrived at 6.4 million US as of 14 December 2022. Um, Let me just see if there are. Um, uh, what were the concerns about the CEO? Um, I think the complaint regarding the CEO is that, uh, from what I have discerned, is that he seems to be, the allegation is that he's strong arming and trying to shove down the fund management option uh, to the creditor group, when in fact, a certain portion of the creditor group simply wants an exit, a wind down and an exit. I, I think the short answer is, is that, that that is uh, not correct, Your Honor. Uh, the, the, the company is, um, in fact, as, as Your Honor uh, knows, had wanted to pursue an acquisition and a buyout by a third party, in, 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 in this case, Nexo. Uh, but the fund management option was the alternative plan, which was relatively uh, 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 risk managed. Uh, handled by a third party independent uh, uh, fund manager, which would allow for transparency. In fact, the management does not is not going to play a role in the fund management. Um, and it is essentially uh, uh, the fund manager that, that, that operates and manages that fund. So I, uh, I'm not sure what's the basis for suggesting that uh, uh, the CEO has a uh, sinister motive in, in advancing the fund management agenda, when in fact that has always been a backup option, Your Honor. All right. Yeah. Um, in any event, the question of the merits of the fund management option as compared to a liquidation scenario or a wind, a simple distribution, um, is, is something that can be 
decided upon by the creditors group themselves uh, if and when a scheme meeting is convened uh, for voting, Your Honour. All right. Um, and is there anything further at this point, Mr. Ong? Uh, not for now, Your Honour. Thank All right. you. All right. We, what I will do is we will go through the comments, see what we can respond, have uh, Mr. Ong respond to first, and then I'll see whether, who wants to speak. I think some hands have already been put up. Now, uh, what I think I should also uh, highlight uh, for everyone's attention is that the scheme, if we ever get to a scheme proposal, it, and I'm just summarizing in very broad terms here, there will have to be an application by the company to the court uh, for permission to call a scheme meeting. There will be some requirements under the law, including the dissemination of proper information and that the meetings be held in a way that facilitates uh, participation and discussion, basically. Uh, there'll be of course some challenges uh with uh all the creditors here uh given your distribution around the world but we will come to that later but there will be they will have to ask for permission to call scheme meeting there will be some requirements i will be primarily concerned about the dissemination of information and the fairness of the structure of the voting in some uh, scheme proposals, they will divide up the creditors into different classes. I will try need to make sure that the cl any class division will be fair. Now, I'll come back to Mr. Ong to ask him whether at this point they plan to have any separation of classes. Then there's a then the law imposes uh, certain voting and voting requirements, and if you pass the voting requirements, the scheme will be. Uh, approved by the meeting, and then they'll come back to the court uh, for approval of the uh, scheme vote. And again, I will be concerned with looking at the scheme meeting, make sure everything's fair, and basically whether the scheme that's been accepted is uh, makes commercial sense, basically. Once it's approved, it binds everyone affected by the scheme, whether or not you voted for the scheme, you will be bound. In addition, there are some other mechanisms under the law, including what we call cram down provisions. Uh, basically, if you're divided into classes in some situations, even if your particular class rejected the proposal, you might still be bound if it's an application to cram down on the basis of other classes voting in favor. I don't think uh, we should go into all these details uh, at this point, but basically that's one possibility, right? But the upshot of it is two stage process will be a two stage process will be involved. First is the approval of the court for a meeting. Then secondly, assuming that the vote goes through for the court to approve the plan as voted on at the meeting. But once every it, the court approves it, it binds everyone uh, covered by this scheme even if you voted against it. All right, so that's the upshot of the scheme mechanism uh, in Singapore. Uh, there's some other nuances and other mechanisms which I don't think uh, I need to get into at this point. All right. Now, uh, with that in mind, uh, I think, let me draw through the questions that perhaps Mr. Ong can address at this point. Then those of you who are not uh, satisfied to answer can Raise your hand to ask further questions. Hold on, let me see now. All right, so basically, all right, I confirm that only the panelists can see the questions at this time. All right, uh, so there's a question from Mr. All right, uh, perhaps at this point, Mr. Ong, can you identify, uh, state in broad terms, is there any plan to divide up the scheme, the creditors according to different classes or into different classes? Uh, not the unsecured creditors, uh, Your Honor. The only uh, point I wanted to flag on this is that there are two secured creditors, right? So, but other than these two secured creditors, all others are unsecured and there's no plan to split them into. All right. For the record, can you state who the secured creditors are? Uh, there is uh, an account, one that has been identified in the affidavits as counterparty A. We are under confidentiality obligations in terms of disclosing the identity of that party. 
uh, uh -huh. the other one is a uh, FTX uh, trading on it's uh, also secured uh, secured yes all right so all the others all the account, other account holders should be put together in a separate class yes <laughs> do you have an estimate of how many might be involved About 150,000. 150,000. 150, and you'll be working on a voting mechanism, I assume. That's correct, Your Honor. Uh, virtual voting mechanism. All right. Uh, so basically, there'll be probably two classes uh, one for the secured creditors and one for the unsecured creditors. All right. And let's see now. So I think there'll be a question about who gets. To you, whether you get some of the money back from Mr. Murthy. So that's been laid out 100% possibly in three years. All right, there's been a complaint by Mr. Dorfeld about the delays. I, I, Mr. Ong has tried to address that, but we'll come back to you, Mr. Dorfeld, if you want to speak on that. Mr. Uh, Matthews, you had some comments which you can raise in questions later. All right, you have some concerns. All right, you have concerns about why they're pursuing this. All right, so we'll come to that. Uh, I'll let you speak on that. <sighs> All right, Mr. Abhishek Arya asks, why is the liquidation scenario so low at 16 to 29, given the asset liability gap is just uh, 90 mil? Mr. Ong, do you think you'll be able to answer that now? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Um, that, I think, for, 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 for the attendees' benefit, that was, in fact, covered at page 28 of the, proposed, uh, the presentation that was uh, uh, circulated on 26 December, as well as uh, presented at the town hall on 5th January. Uh, in essence, uh, one would see that, essentially, it is a write-down of the value of the receivables uh, that has impacted uh, the recovery. Uh, so there is a liquidation discount, for example, in relation to a particular set of receivables of 76% uh, and another uh, set of receivables to the extent of 60%. Uh, so these write-downs have meant that the total realizable assets estimated uh, in a liquidation uh, scenario is 44% uh, discount. And that has reduced the ERV for liquidation uh, from 109 million to 148 million only. Uh, that then translates to 16 to 29 percent, Your Honor. All right. And uh, Mr. Matthews has raised a concern that the email system for creditors doesn't work. Uh, have you tested the system, Mr. Ong? Um, I'm Are told, yeah, I, I, I'm told, Your Honor, that, that, that it does. So what has happened is that emails come in. Uh, and they get pro, uh, sent across firstly to the COC. They are tabu uh, categorized together, bucketed together, uh, depending on their nature. Uh, and then uh, the company seeks to address them uh, with the COC as well as at town halls and, and, and updates, Your Honor. So that's uh, how it's been streamlined, Your Honor. But there is uh, no, um, uh, it's not the case that, and, and, and we think it's inefficient uh, and not possible really uh you know uh, realistically to actually respond to each and every email so we've right, could, could, could you could you just test the system with mr yes. matthews all right mr joshua matthews later all right just a, uh try to do a one-on-one -on -one test get someone to do that yes all right uh and i think there's some of the concerns about engagement with the coc from mr zubin patrao uh all right uh that's the coc uh, held a COC only uh, town hall with the participants. Uh, no, not no. All right, so I, I leave it to the COC members. But one suggestion I would have is to see whether any of the COC members are amenable to having this uh, discussion, COC creditor only discussion uh, at some point. All right, I know I can't force them to do so, but I would encourage them to. If any of them are willing to do so, to uh, to do this, could you report on that at the next hearing? Yes, sure. Uh, any possibility of expanding the COC beyond seventeen? I think Mr. 
Sean Sanborn has raised the query whether it can be done. He's asking for it to be extended to 70. I, I think the, the, the reality is that it, it, it gets really unwieldy and inefficient. Um, I think what, what we've done is that um, in the, when forming the COC, it was made up of people from uh, across section of the globe um, and, and taking into account also uh, a few uh, top 20 overall unsecured creditors. Uh, so it was a balance that was struck and, and that's why it ended up with a uh, final list of 17 names, Your Honor. Um, mm -hmm. But 70, I think the, the, from, from experience, it's going to be extremely unwieldy and, and I don't think it, 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 it detracts from the purpose of the CMC, Your Honor. All right. Uh, Mr. Luke Thomas, who's a, oh, sorry, hold on, before Mr. Thomas, there's another chat. Mr. Uman uh, also has concerns about the liquidation. I'm not sure whether that's addressed. And he's given a comment that uh, creditors feel forced to get into the fund management scenario three years, and maybe it's better to let the creditors choose to take the funds as they become available and invest and use them as they wish. Uh, any response to that? Uh, yes, Your Honor. The, the first point regarding the liquidation scenario, I've already addressed, uh, flagging the relevant page in the presentation that was circulated on 26 December, uh, the 44% uh, uh, valuation uh, of, of the uh, receivables is, is essentially the, the basis upon which uh, the 16 to 29% was arrived at. Um, as to uh, the fact that creditors or certain creditors may feel uh, that it is uh, the fund option management option is actually not attractive. I think this is precisely why there is a voting mechanism. And for the benefit of the attendees, I mean, in order for the uh, fund management proposal to fly and be implemented, it requires a, a majority in number of 51% or 50% and above uh, of creditors to vote in its favor and 75% and or above in value voting in favor of that. So the decision actually uh, rests with the creditors uh, uh, body as and when the scheme meeting is convened. All right. Uh, I think there's some comments. I will carry out the comments in a short while, but I think one of the things that's come to my mind is that with 150,000 account holders and from what I can see of the comments, uh, I think a number of the account holders do are unhappy and I think they want to communicate with each other uh, about the unhappiness and to try to, in a sense, uh, persuade each other. And I think they should be given that opportunity. Uh, I appreciate the company may not want, or I understand the company may not want to have it on its uh, Telegram channel. How, how big is your Telegram chat group, roughly? I'll have to just give me a moment. I assume it's not all 150,000. It's about 7,000 plus. 7,000 plus, Your Honor. All right. <clears throat> all right. Again, while the applicant is pursuing this, I, I don't think it's going to be too oppressive or uh, expensive. Uh, basically, what I would like to do is to have a forum or space for the account holders, uh, I assume you have the official emails to be able to just chat mm -hmm. with each other, to talk to each other, to try to lobby whatever comments so they can marshal the voting as required when the scheme comes up. Yes, Your Honor. Do you think, you, so basically I don't want, the company doesn't have to be involved, but I just want to see whether it's possible for the company as applicant to set up this space for the, uh, creditors, possibly through their official e uh, registered emails, to canvas uh, for support amongst each other. Those who support the scheme can make their points known. Those who object can make their points known. Uh, yep. I hope uh, it will be a uh, civilized conversation, but even if it's not, I think basically no one's uh, going to try to intervene in that space. So basically it's a space for the creditors to try to talk to each other and uh, no assumption of uh, responsibility by anyone for the identity and all that beyond the registered email. So that kind of space.
Can we do that? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's feasible. Your yeah, basically a bare bones thing. I yeah. want, but I want to give the opportunity for the uh, account holders to canvas each other ahead of any vote. So yeah. I think that'd be important for me. Yes, you. I pinned that down. All right. So for those of you who have great concerns, uh, I appreciate. I understand that uh, you sometimes feel you may not be able to speak to each other or reach out to others in the same way. So that's what I'm trying to do in this space. I suspect it's not going to be a free for all and I don't think I can make the company or anyone else be responsible for moderation for the content and you'll have to basically exercise your own discretion about who to believe, who to uh, buy in. But I want you to give you that space so that you can at least put your, forth your views, all right? Um, so we'll see how that pans out. All right, thank you. Uh, so Mr. Kershen, um, I, I understand your concerns that you expressed that you don't want to accept the risk and you want a low risk wind down. Uh, so that point has been noted. And I think uh, those of your fellow creditors who agree with you can vote with you. Uh, let me come then to Mr. Jujunvala. Ah, all right. Uh, All right, there's some questions about the scheme. Let me try to collect that together. All right, uh, so Mr. Jared Vale, uh, all right, there's some questions from a few of you, uh, Mr. Jared Vale, Ms. Pavan S, and a few others about what happens with the fund manager, how that's going to work. Uh, we cannot really go into all of this because at this point in the process, I do not, uh, or rather we do not require the company to lay out everything in detail. Uh, but I will ask the company to take note of these uh, chat questions and see which they can address uh, either today or uh, by communication subsequently. All right. Uh, there's a question from Mr. Jujunwala about the scheme process. So what I can say is that there is no uh, absolute guillotine or upper limit to a extension of moratorium. It depends on what the judge makes of the proposal that are being worked on, the complexity of the situation, and sometimes the uh, whether uh, uh, there's been enough to make up for a chance for the company to put something together. Uh, my own general preference is to try to move to a scheme as fast as possible, but I have in the past for complex uh, situations, uh, in particular for high flux, given the extensions over a fairly long period of time, that's about, I think two years in all before I pulled the plug, uh, but that, to my mind, it was a very complex uh, situation involving a very large uh, company uh, and with some potential uh, promise because they were involved in uh, desalination, amongst other things, and they had the hope of reviving the company. So in this situation, uh, not to prejudge it, but I have some concerns about letting any of the crypto companies operate under the shield for too long, especially given the volatility of the market and, the, and that it will be very hard for us, any of us to actually predict how things will pan out. So I will want, not want to see the uh, extension go on for too long. All right. Um... All right, there's been some further concerns about the email process, not able to speak. So I, I hope uh, we will be able to address the questions about the communication of the communications of the COC. All right. Um,
All right, so I think there's a bit of a dis discussion about the managed wind down process. Mr. Ong, would you like to address that? Yes, Your Honor. I think the, the as I discern, uh, the question is whether the uh, creditor group will apart or as an alternative to the fund management option have the uh, opportunity to consider a management wind down. And yeah. I think this ties in with uh, Mr. Luke Thomas's uh, request uh, for uh, the company to provide a detailed analysis on managed wind down versus fund manager versus liquidation, taking all uh, costs and, and, and factors into consideration um, so that all, all the risks could be properly considered by the creditors. Uh, I think the short answer is, is yes, that analysis uh, should be done and will be presented uh, to the creditor group uh, for consideration. And then the pros and cons of each, uh, whether liquidation, fund management, or manage mine down, uh, and how each of that would work, and the timeframes and timetable for that, uh, will be presented and uh, for consideration. All right, thank you. All right, for the COC, uh, can I uh, ask the company to look into perhaps expanding it? I, I think 70 is a bit too large, but maybe it uh, to 25 or thereabouts um, with a I think uh, spread, especially amongst uh, the smaller account holders uh, from India, but of course taking in uh, as part of the number uh, increase some increased representation for the mid to mid level uh, account holders from other jurisdictions, including the US and. Uh, remember your distribution in Europe. All right, so basically another eight more or so uh, with a larger number perhaps of uh, smaller account holders and increased representation from uh, the US and Europe for the mid account holders. All right. Yes, you're noted. All right, we'll try to explore that. Uh, could I, I'll give directions for the company to update me on this perhaps in about two weeks time, all right? Yes, sir. thank you. All right, uh, all right. I, I'm sorry that I don't think I can address all the questions at this point, but uh, what we will do is we will, after today, distribute the chat uh, to the applicants and also ask for the chat to be distributed in uh, PDF format, hopefully to all of you. Uh, by email. All right, so I'll try to make sure that the other queries are highlighted. All right. All right. All right. Uh, all right. Let me see then uh, uh, our hands, uh, which are up. Sorry. Annie, could you help me? Uh, yes, so we have Mr. Jonathan Bowman. Uh, can we promote him, please? Yes, promoting him. All right, sorry, uh, before that, all right, so I appreciate that some of you may have questions and all that. Some of it we will try to collate and uh, bring together. And I will, at the end of the day, when the approval process is sought for, take into account how responsive the company has been to these queries and how fair they've been to the creditors as a whole. Uh, unfortunately, I have to impose some parameters on the chat discussion, on the responses to the chats, as well as the uh, questions raised orally. Uh, I will try to give as much time as I can, but unfortunately, I can't give an infinite amount of time. So could I ask all those who speak to keep it to about five minutes or so, and then uh, I will let Mr. Ong respond uh, to everyone uh, at the end of the day. I may need to impose a guillotine depending on how many of you will speak, but I'll try to give you as much uh, possible time as possible, maybe about half an hour to about 40 minutes. The rest of it, we will probably have to go through uh, written responses from the uh, company, all right? So, sorry, uh, was it Mrs. Holman? Was it, sorry, I, sorry, I got the wrong name. Perhaps. Yes, 
Jonathan Woolman. Thank you. Woolman. All right, Mr. Joe Woolman. All right, yes, please proceed. Yeah, thank you for letting me address the courtroom. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm one of the largest vault holders um, mm -hmm. uh, in the top 100. And uh, uh, most people's concerns are they want to escape um, the management of vault and and their advisors as well. So with this fund manager option, and uh, it doesn't seem like it's a uh, very, you know, especially as the point you point out, uh, it, it seems a little, uh, you know, uh, fluffed up that, you know, they're gonna be able to return seven to 10% when they actually might lose 30 to 40 to 50% more of our money. So one of the most important things I think is that there needs to be an RDA, a reverse stocks auction with any fund manager scheme, because, most people want to get out and they want to take their money out even with a haircut and i think it's very important that if we move forward and especially if mr ong you can uh you know relay this to your team if they want this vote to pass many people will vote against the fund manager scheme without an rda because they will be locked in and they will have no opportunity to get their money out especially people like me who have their money in uh stable coins so mm. I have no ability to appreciate my true value. I could take 30% of my value right now and get way more uh, percentage of my own terms. So uh, I just want to ask, you know, uh, is there any guarantee that you can make, Mr. Ong, that there will be an RDA with the uh, fund manager scheme? All right. I'll 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 have all the questions come out and then we'll have uh, Mr. Ong respond in one go. All right. Uh, so we have a total of uh, eight other hands. So... I hope we won't have too many. Uh, who's, Annie, could you just uh, send me the chat with the next names, please? Yes, the next one will be- uh, No, no, uh, send, it, send it to me by email or chat. Sure. Hold on a moment, everyone. All right, uh, perhaps any we don't uh, waste too much time. Perhaps uh, you can just let in the next one. Uh, you let me know who it is, and then you email me the rest of the list. All right. Uh, okay. Okay. The next All one right. is uh, Mr. Jeffrey Hobush. All right, Mr. Hobush, you'll be promoted up. Thank you. Mr. Hobush, yes, thank you. I, I think you might be muted, Mr. Hobush. Unmute. All right, you're, you're through. All right, thank you. Okay. All right, so we're in. All right, first of all, Your Honor, thank you very much for your explanation at the opening. You actually um, changed a little bit of what I wanted to present to the court, but I appreciate it because it made a lot of sense and answered a lot of questions. Um, first of all, I'm uh, one of the top creditors as well. I'm a U.S. based creditor that has close to a million dollars locked on bold. Um, <clears throat> Not too happy about that, obviously. Um, I will say up front, I am for the moratorium extension. I understand the ramifications of that. Uh, my issues are how that time that you're granting them is being used and how it's going to be used moving forward. Uh, the one gentleman said earlier, he was talking about the Nexo deal, and I don't want to harp on that very much. But the one thing he's leaving out, and I don't know who did the negotiation on this, but they supposedly locked us into an exclusive deal with Nexo that needs to be exited from by both parties. Nexo refuses to do that, even though whether they're being invaded in Bulgaria for money laundering or uh, can't serve US-based customers, it doesn't matter. We apparently can't get out of that and we can't enter into any other agreement with any other platform to move our, our funds to that. Um, that's locking us into something that uh, is not working very well. And I happen to know that there's at least one platform based in the US that would like to have our assets under management moved over. Um, and now we can't do that because of the negotiation they've done. That's the way they've used the time that you've granted them. Now what they're talking about with the fund manager option and the gentleman previous to me kind of touched on this. Uh, this is something that I didn't sign up for when I signed up for Vault. I signed up for a fixed income product that 
I would be paid out on based on my funds being lent out on uh, secured loans that were over collateralized. We've learned now that's not the case. So we were lied to upfront with that. Now their, their scheme, as they're portraying it, is basically they're going to take what's left of our funds that haven't been lost up to this point. They're going to put them in one large fund that's held under DeFi payments, which is the company for the CEO of Vald. He'll maintain ownership of those funds and then turn them over to a fund manager of his choice. Yes, third party, but that person or organization is going to then gamble with our funds in a highly volatile crypto market over the next three years. I don't know who this person is that's going to be... Uh, Oh, the host is All right, uh, Mr. Harbush, can I uh, ask you to stop for a minute? I need to say something to everyone. All right, so uh, we've got uh, 10 persons lined up uh, already to speak. So I, I think I have to draw the line at that point. What I will do is I will let those of you who have queries fill up the chat. And as I mentioned, I will distribute it to everyone and we will try to take off in terms of responses uh, and answers uh, to make sure that they are re basically responded to uh, after today. All right, so I, I'm afraid I have to draw the line at uh, the 10th person who's put up his hand. All right, the rest of you can put in your questions. You may not be responded to today. I'll try to do a scan if there's anything that affects my decision today, but I may not be able to respond to everyone or I may not ask Mr. Ong to respond to everyone. All right, thank you. So back to you, Mr. Harbush. I'm sorry, how much, I saw something about the video being stopped or started, did you uh, hear any of that? All right, so, so I, I think we missed a bit. I thought you had stopped to allow me to speak to everyone for a while. That's okay, uh, I figured uh, it out eventually, I apologize. All right, all right. so basically uh, you want to have your assets out as soon as possible, correct? Uh, basically, yes. And uh -huh. the idea of us putting them into one large fund that will then be turned over to someone to, I'm sorry, I'm gonna use the term gamble with for three mm -hmm. years, in the crypto right. market, that is not what we, what I for myself at least signed up for. And mm -hmm. um, there are multiple other issues with that. The person before me touched on stable coins versus people who have crypto. I won't get into that right now because I, I know a lot of other people want to speak. But it's, it's it's the other guy said something about the sinister motive of the CEO and and not to touch mm -hmm. on that. All I will say about that is. Why will our funds not simply be returned to us through something like a voluntary windup where our funds are returned to us? And when another counterparty repays, it was our funds that were lent out to them, repay them to us. Why this concept of turning all our funds over to someone else to manage and win them back for us over the course of three years? That's, that's just ludicrous to me. Uh, it makes zero sense. I'm sorry, I, I don't understand that. Right. And I've already been through some things with them on like an AMA where we can't get straight answers. You ask them one question, it makes zero sense. And then finally you press them and you get, you get the truth. I'm just not signing up for that. Um, and I heard what you said about judicial management process. Um, that's something we'll have to look into, I guess, if this is not something that can be done as far as moving in a new direction. They, they need to take the time that you grant them and figure out how to give our funds back to us, not give them to someone else to gamble with for a few years. All right. That's all. all right, thank, thank you, you Mr. Harbush. All right, next up, uh, Mr. Donahue. Mr. Jim Donahue. Uh, Any, you can uh, de-promote the others who've spoken. Yes. Right. Mr. Jim Donahue. Minute, please. All right, Mr. Donahue. Right, well, will, all right, uh, Mr. Donahue is up. Um, yes, all right, your, bit, your audio is off, uh, Mr. Donahue. Right, thank you. Okay. Yes, um, I can hear you, thank you. Uh, can you see me now? <laughs> uh, I can see your forehead, Mr. Donahue. I don't know if you can <laughs> All right, thank you. Oh, super. Um, good morning, Your Honor, and uh, thank you to this court for 
allowing me an opportunity to speak briefly. I just wanted to um, express my opposition to extending the moratorium mm -hmm. and encourage all the parties to immediately institute a wind up or a liquidation event of some sort. Um, and the basis for that is um, my total lack of faith in vault management and their financial advisors. And uh, the grounds for that would be based mainly on uh, the total um, abysmal communication. Um, the entire framework is just uh, frankly pathetic. We have a COC established, which does not have any legs within the vault management infrastructure. They're basically just a sounding board where we communicate our concerns to the COC and hopefully they are bounced off the walls in rooms with vault management. And maybe something is filtered back to us, maybe it's not, but basically our interaction with the COC is a forum of uh, conflict and arguments where COC members basically fight against themselves. And there's a lot of I told you so going on. It's, it's very unproductive. And the email communication is similar. Uh, it's essentially a black hole in my estimation. I've sent uh, eight emails to the COC. I've received one reply from one COC member. And um, in other communications, I've received replies from uh, Vault's financial advisors. Uh, um, in the uh, to summarize them, it's basically um, you know, we, we need more time to address these concerns. We don't have any answers to your questions right now, um, but thank you for the feedback. It's, it's basically an opportunity for us to provide feedback to them without actually getting answers, solid factual answers to questions. And I feel the same way about the town hall forums, which have been conducted online. These uh, come off to me as a viewer from the inside as basically a show. Uh, you know, I can't say for sure whether the, the, the Q&A, AMA sessions, as we call them, are scripted or not, but they certainly come off that way. Uh, we were given an opportunity to submit in advance, weeks in advance, questions to the last AMA town hall sessions conducted on January 5th, and none of my 18 questions were even addressed, let alone answered. Um, and uh, immediately following that AMA, there was an impromptu uh, kind of um, uh, smaller AMA directly with the Vault CEO, um, who last minute kind of dropped that on us through Zoom. And similarly, questions, real questions were, were being dodged and we were being encouraged to submit follow-up emails. Um, and if we referenced uh, facts that were presented during the first AMA session, which was back in July of last year, um, they're now contradicting claims made during that time. Um, simple things that, you know, should have been easily interpreted as factual are now being conflated and, and um, restated as being subject to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, subject to change and things of that sort. Um, uh, and then I, I would just want to mention something about the, the mudslinging that's been going on with wall management and Nexo, which after six months for it to reach that stage is, is really <laughs> um, kind of an eye-opening uh, experience, you know, seeing that this is, it's real people's money at stake here and the sense of urgency and integrity within Vault is, is simply not there. Uh, that's all I'd like to say and, and thank you for your time. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Donahue. Next, uh, we have Mr. Johnny Edelman. Hi. Right, Mr. Edelman, thank you. Hi, Mr. Justice. Thank you very much again for the opportunity to uh, to speak. Um, I just wanted to, I mean, the simple question really for me to, to Mr. Ong is um, obviously we've been through the uh, estimated receivables and liquidation, uh, which is 16 to 29%. But as I think both the, uh, all three people before me have spoken, we, there's very little um, 
numbers and estimates of what will be received in a managed wind down, i.e. where it's not full sort of liquidation and loans being written off today, but where you conduct an RDA, those people who want to exit can exit, given an assumption that a, you know, I, I think at least 20 to 30 percent of full creditors would likely take a significant haircut. I mean, a lot of people said they would be willing to take 30 cents a dollar. That could actually mean that the entire asset liability mismatch could be almost closed subsequent to an RDA and then perhaps subsequent to waiting for the return of certain receivables such as counterparty A loan and the FTX funds. But there are people who would be willing to stay in a managed wind down, but I don't see why that would need to be the same as a fund manager who would be trading in the markets with our funds. Again, there's a couple of other, the other creditors have made the point that was not what we signed up for initially. We signed up for what was supposed to be a fixed income product um, on collateralized loans, not trading in the markets. So I just feel like there's a lot of emphasis of it's either fund manager or liquidation. Why are we not presenting the, the option of a managed wind down with an independent third party who is managing the retrieval of the assets and between now and that attempt to retrieve what assets are left um, that we conduct an RDA ahead of that. That seems to me like the most logical step forward. Um, and I think particularly, I would just echo some of the concerns of the prior creditors of the fact that today, all management have not been particularly honest with many of the creditors. For starters, it was marketed as fixing on product. It wasn't. They lied. They were trading in 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 markets um, without. It, it wasn't just uh, over collateralized loans that was being traded with 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 creditor funds. Um, secondly, obviously, there was the email from the full CEO, and I think it was eighth of June last year, um, where they said they did not have liquidity issues. That was a week prior to declaring bankruptcy, um, et cetera, et cetera. There, there have been various issues where communication and the honesty and integrity of full management is certainly brought into question for many, many creditors, which makes this very, even more frustrating when things are being delayed and prolonged. Why not have, why not have a vote? I mean, particularly as, as you said as well, it's gonna be very difficult to organize a vote with the creditors distributed so globally and coordinating with that many creditors. So that vote should also include an option. It should be a vote for a fund manager option and also an, op an option for a wind down. If neither of those were to receive majority, then perhaps you are looking at liquidation scenario or some other um, scenario. But, but to just vote on the fund manager when it seems like the majority of creditors do not want a fund manager, if it doesn't pass, are we then back to extending the moratorium and another three months? Or are we automatically into liquidation? I don't know, but either of those are not particularly palatable when I think there's a large core of creditors who I've spoken to who are actually in favor of just a managed wind down, just close out the, the, the risk that is being run, run an RDA. People can take what they want from that RDA and then over time return whatever is received to creditors. Right, thank you, Mr. Edelman. Uh before we turn to the next person, we just to mention uh, specifically that in relation, uh, that in terms of our processes uh, here in Singapore, you could have a voluntary winding up as in a liquidation, or you could apply to the court for uh, liquidation, but uh, it doesn't occur automatically just because the moratorium is lifted. So again, to emphasize for everyone's understanding, the more is a very kind of passive kind of thing. It's a shield. If the ex a bar time is not extended, the shield goes away, but it doesn't mean anything actually necessarily has to happen after the shield goes away. Uh, in most situations, we expect that once the shield goes away, people will start filing lawsuits. Some people might start filing applications for judicial management or liquidation. That's the likelihood. But in some cases, even when the shield goes away, nothing happens because the creditors don't think it's worthwhile to incur legal costs trying to pursue something, or there could be other reasons. But yeah, in some situations, the shield goes down, but after that, uh, nothing really happens. So in most uh, situations, if you want to have something to happen after the uh, moratorium expires, you probably have to initiate something. And of course, that will entail legal costs, uh, transaction costs. So just to highlight that for everyone, and 
for you to consider and take legal advice. And I must emphasize that what I'm saying right now is just a very broad level kind of summary to help you understand the situation. There may be nuances uh, that I can't go into, and it might be something that for those of you who feel strongly and have the means for you to retain uh, Singapore lawyers, but I'll come to that uh, later. All right, so let me then move on to the next uh, person who's asked to speak. Uh, I believe it's uh, Mr. Brian Murray. Yes, thank you, Fiona, for allowing me to address the court. Okay. Um, I, I actually was part of the, the first court hearing and um, since that time, there's just, we've actually we've had very little communication, obviously with with Vault Management. Um, all those pathways have been shut down. Um, we actually have formed a Vault Creditors Association, the VCA, um, with a lot of a lot of people who have high net worths uh, or, or high value on on Vault, including myself with seven figures. And there's just a few things that I would like to point out. And the first thing being when this whole thing started, um, Vault Management entered into a, an exclusive deal with Nexo. Every other clip, uh, crypto platform that got into some type of financial issues or troubles put their assets out the bid to, to the open crypto community. So um, I'd like for Mr. Ong to address why, on, why did they sign an exclusive deal with Nexo in the beginning without putting it out to the market for the open bid, for the highest bid? Um, there's been several platforms that have been acquired. Um, obviously, Binance has a, um, a lending uh, uh, recovery fund that they, they developed as well. So that's one answer that we'd like to have. Um, we submitted 37 uh, detailed emails to the AMA. Um, not one of those emails got answered with uh, a lot of contradic contradictions with affidavits and et cetera. So, um, the other major problem, I think, is that a lot of the creditors have no faith in, in vault management. And here's a great example. Um, Eight million dollars of the funds were trapped on FTX. When this situation occurred, why did they not pull all, all the assets and put them into their, their own control, their own holdings, their own accounts? Every other, like Nexo was able to get um, a couple hundred million dollars off of FTX before it collapsed. It was public knowledge that the, that the, that the uh, platform was collapsing. And Vald decided to keep our funds on FTX. So we ended up losing, I think he cleared up today, 6.4 million. Um, the other thing with the COCs, first of all, thank you for adding more members to the COC, but there's no way to have any type of open dialogue with the COC. Six of them are participating. And I think the other big problem is I don't think you have to be wealthy to be on the COC because I think it should be fair and balanced, but with myself and some other people have seven figures on there. I'm in the top 21 creditors, and I was I, all my communications to be on the COC were ignored. Um, the type of people who are, are representing us, do they have you know accounting backgrounds, finding finance backgrounds, understanding, understanding uh, you know how money works, et cetera. So that's another big concern uh, of ours. And then finally, we like I said, we formed a committee called the VCA, and we actually have a, a, an email uh, address that people can go to. It's info at baldcreditors.net to get the facts about what's happened and the misrepresentation. And your honor, the last thing I would like to say is Darshan just put out in his, his ninth um, affidavit today on page 9.24 uh, claims that, that during the first affidavit on July 4th, 2022, DeFi payments suspended all customer deposits, withdrawals, and, tried, and, and trading. Um, the point I would like to make is why there's not a lot of trust with the vault and vault management. I put in withdrawal on uh, June 29th for $723,000 to purchase a home for my family. That withdrawal was denied uh, six days before the platform was shut down. And we actually have proof that there's other creditors that, have, that are in the same situation. And we also have proof that there was, they were still accepting deposits. So, you know, how you want to interpret that is very, you know, in the U.S., we call that theft. So I think as a whole, this fund manager, the other, the other point I'd like to make, too, is the fund manager that's proposed, the fees that they want to charge um, 
for this fund manager is one and a half percent of all assets per quarter. So if we have $300 million worth of assets, we're, li we're literally paying a fund manager $18 million a year to manage a fund plus 20% of the profits. Now here in the US, I have other uh, finances with hedge funds. They charge 2% and 20% of the profits. That's standard across fund management and hedge funds. So why are we paying for a premium when the fund manager hasn't been, neither one of the fund managers has been disclosed, their, their performance, their performance history. And then finally, what I'd like to say is I think a lot of people would definitely want a reverse Dutch auction to get their funds off the platform. And I do believe that gap could be closed dramatically by doing a reverse Dutch auction. But um, more importantly, I think other people should also, we should also consider is the court or a third party taking these assets and putting them into cold storage. We don't need them. We don't need them managed. We don't need them to be gambled with. We need to keep them in cold storage and wait for the crypto market to recover. Once it recovers, then the funds should be dispersed. That should also be an option that hasn't been. Vault has given us no options to vote on. They've, they've dictated what has happened from day one. Um, and it's absurd that Nexo got an exclusive deal when you could have put it out on the open market and got a bidding war to get the best deal possible for the creditors. As a whole, I think the creditors feel that we are not being represented, and it's definitely not our best interest at heart. Thank you for allowing me to address the court. All right. Thank you, Mr. Murray. Uh, let me move on to Mr. Damir Butmir. Good morning, Your Honor. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, so I'm a top 15 creditor of uh, Vault. I'm not a member of the COC, so I like to think I'm fairly independent. Just to provide um, for your honor's uh, privilege, uh, my point of view, I think, uh, first off, the communication from Vault has improved drastically since uh, the last time that we connected. Just based on that, that aspect, I think, uh, uh, as a top creditor, I, I support the moratorium extension. Uh, beyond that, they presented a high level uh, of a plan going forward um, that one of the associates mentioned earlier, that's within that three month timeline. So I think that's a relatively short time period to present a plan and get a vote. So I think uh, that's good news. Um, I think, uh, well, I do have reservations with the vault uh, management, uh, I think in particular the fund manager option will ultimately pass a vote. I, I personally met with the two shortlisted fund managers. I do have a background in, in finance. I think uh, the fund manager option personally is the best uh, way forward. I think the majority of the other creditors will agree once they become more informed. I think that analysis should be done between those three different options that were mentioned and emailed out to everybody and everybody can make their own decisions. But I ultimately think most creditors will uh, approve that that option uh, along with an RDA for people who want to get out uh, earlier and that's okay. Um, I think uh, the other thing to mention is that uh, some creditors uh, are also uh, hindering uh, the process, and I hope the you know the court uh, takes that into consideration um, as well. I think some of the creditors have different goals in mind in terms of duration, and in terms of recovery, and so um, I think we have to make sure that no one group is uh, affected uh, by the other. Some of the other previous comments actually would affect uh, other creditors negatively. Um, and, and I think the last thing that I, would, that I would mention, I think it's very important within this, if the uh, moratorium extension is granted, and I hope it is, within these three months, there, there is a vote in terms of a scheme of arrangements to get approval for this plan um, going forward. And before that happens, that uh, the three options are very clear, clearly laid out to everybody so they can make an informed decision that's in there. Um, best uh, interest, but at, at the end of the day, I think communication from the company 
has improved. I've sent emails, I've gotten responses, I've gotten responses from the COC and modifier of the COC. Um, so just on that, I'm okay with uh, extending the next three months. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Uh, next to uh, Mr. Abhishek Arya. Oh, you're, you're not uh, asking. All right, then we'll move on to Mr. Dorfil. Mr. William Dorfil, please. Yes, Mr. Dorfield. Um, you don't have your audio yet, thanks. Yes, sir. Can All you hear right. me now? Okay. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, thank you, yes, thank you sir. Uh, I wanted to start by thanking your honor for um, doing a couple things. First of all, uh, changing the, uh, the hour for these hearings to a, a, a more amenable time for North Americans. Thank you, sir. Uh, and as well as for accepting uh, submissions via email, a number were, uh, um, were submitted. Uh, one quick question on that, Your Honor, if, if I may, uh, were you able to uh, review the recently submitted uh, January 11th report that I provided? Uh, yes, I have. And uh, you can summarize it, your concerns from there for the record. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. And, and thank you, uh, understanding it was a last minute submission. We very much appreciate uh, you accepting that. Uh, and lastly, uh, thank you for, in this session, Your Honor, uh, requesting an official creditor forum be set up. Um, this is um, exactly what's needed. Um, uh, per the last speaker, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mayor Butmer, who uh, is, is in the extreme minority uh, claiming that there's been enhanced communications, that is because he's a top 20 creditor. And we all know that the top 20 creditors are being targeted by Darshan to win their vote so he can pass his initiatives. So I just want to state that all other creditors that have spoken today have stated the very clear and obvious fact that communications have been drastically degraded. Your Honor, in the November 7th hearing, um, you, you gave some directives, and I know there's no requirements. You just make recommendations the company can or cannot abide, but you explicitly asked uh, per some of our suggestions, including mine, that the company delivered to you by November 25th in an affidavit, a statement of Bald's financial condition, I should say DeFi payments, financial condition as of June 16th, uh, uh, what they did in the 11th, uh, in the uh, November 25th affidavit, sir, uh, is provide a statement of uh, liquidity issues, which is not the same as a statement of financial condition. Financial condition explicitly in any kind of uh, accounting refers to assets and liabilities condition. Where that is critically important, sir, is it, of course, brings up the issue of claims that the company was financially stable when, in fact, they were not. We are still waiting for that information. It hasn't been delivered, and we respectfully request that we get that information. It's a fair mm -hmm. question, a highly relevant question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, furthermore, sir, you did ask of them to provide in the November 25th affidavit um, uh, in a proof of uh, in improvement in communications. Uh, well, no, I should say that you asked for improvement in communications to be determined later. Uh, you have heard testimony from a number of, of folks saying there's been abysmal communications, um, that things such as the AMA come off as scripted. Uh, these are all true and accurate statements, sir, with evidence to support them. Um, many of us, including myself, sir, have been putting in mega hours 12 to 14 hours a day for several months, big time over the last three weeks to, uh, to document very carefully the lies, misrepresentations, and deceit happening on the part of all management. I do not say this lightly, sir. We have the evidence to support it. Therefore, they are in direct violation of uh, bona fide procedures uh, that are required in your court to move things forward. And it's, it's, it is relevant, it's important to mention. Now, does that mean I support ending the moratorium? No, we'll get to that if I have time to, sir. But I want to state out front, the, the problem right now, as so many have stated, is a lack of faith and in, involved management based upon their actions. Now, in my uh, January 11th report put out by vaultcreditors.net, and sir, the reason why that site was put together was because on December 28th, Vault shut down the chat forum, which we were all using to communicate and share information, and then provided a very bogus, unsubstantiated claim that uh, there was misinformation being spread and that there was someone disguising, uh, they're putting forth conspiracy theories. 
uh, when it, clearly their intent was to squelch communication, not improve it. Your Honor, it's, it's, it, it's so many of us have felt betrayed by Vald, and it was very clear with that singular act that they were not abiding by your request. So I, I ask you to sincerely uh, consider uh, you know, the lack of bona fide actions on the part of Vald uh, in any decisions uh, going forward, because uh, it, it is proven and we have evidence to show it. And uh, we just simply want fair uh, treatment and we want answers to our questions. Regarding answers to our questions, sir, the uh, one gentleman, uh, Mr. Donahue, aptly pointed out that the most recent January 5th AMA was it's appeared to be scripted. It was, sir. He said he posted 18 questions. I posed 37 questions, all relevant, uh, essential information that we need. Uh, I posed these questions well in advance uh, through proper channels. Uh, over 30 of them were ignored. Um, and we get assurances that we'll get responses. And then I will refer to, in uh, Ms. Darshan's recent affidavit, I believe number nine, he refers to, he claims uh, that some of these are not re relevant for the present purposes and that these have no bearing on the proposed restructuring or the grounds on which a moratorium may be granted or extended. Well, I ask you, sir, to contemplate, is not your directive to them to enhance communications relevant? Uh, are not our questions regarding the breakdown of coins in their coin ledger not relevant? Um, we could go on and on, but the fact of the matter, sir, there is deceit and lies happening with involved management to avoid issues so that they can push forth their agendas to save face. They know that they screwed up. We all know that they screwed up. We've given them time. We've given them six months. Another creditor mentioned aptly, there's been no sense of urgency. That is exactly 100% correct. We need results, we need action now. Um, yeah, and so time is money, Your Honor, and it's our money, it's creditor money, supporting all these lawyers, all these financial advisors who keep engaging in delay tactics and telling and not answering questions and moving the issue forward. Uh, with respect to, uh, if I, I know I'm on limited time here and I don't wanna try and steal the show, I have submitted and I encourage all creditors to please go to ballcreditors.net we have a plethora of information. We set up that website because we are shut down on the chat forum. Of course, there's going to be differing opinions. There's going to be some people that snap at each other. There are COC members saying nasty things to other people. COC members have a very tough job. Many of us have been supportive of their role because to lead, to, to provide guidance, you're always going to get arrows in the back. But it's it's shameful of them to then say, to, to, re, to you know, lower themselves to the level of, of some other discussion. But sir, regarding facts, the eighth and ninth affidavits submitted by Darshan are filled with false and misleading statements. I know I'm on limited time, and I know it's expected just to give a summary. The devil's in the details, and it's impossible to get details in this process because our questions are ignored. I, I, we seek a platform by which we can get decided answers on our questions. Um, I don't know if uh, if I will be afforded the opportunity to speak to and call quick attention to about eight or nine of these false statements made, Your Honor. Uh, but what I hope to also accomplish in my short time with you, in addition to hopefully uh, mentioning some of those, is to indicate that there is a, pr a proposal from the Ball Creditors Alliance at ballcreditors.net, uh, a proposal for um, uh, recommendations on next steps, uh, which I'd like to give a brief summary overview. As well, there's a deep detail regarding the fund manager option, which I'd also like to speak to if, if possible. Um, and also a list of requests that we hope we may ask your honor to, uh, to deliver uh, or ask under consideration of the company. Um, no, if, sorry, Mr. Mm -hmm. Dorfel, you will be sending that to me? Uh, I, I would I, I would be delighted to. Is it okay via the email chains we've used before, sir? Uh, all right, all right. I'll, I'll allow that. All right, thank you. You can send okay. it on to me. I'll send it on. Okay, uh, via Annie uh, uh, Kwan's uh, email. Mm -hmm. uh, My okay. manager. Thank, thank you, you, sir. The the, the key points uh, regarding um, the the November twenty fifth affidavit. Uh, uh, it's a con consistent pattern, Your Honor. It's documented in my uh, January 11th report, whereby answers are not given, uh, and, and they spin things in such a way that it seems that they're doing the right thing. Uh, case in point, everything, Your Honor, hinges. There's multiple people, not just me. You, you, you can get multiple signed affidavits from people to confirm that they were misled in mid-June 2022 
by direct email blasts from Darshan claiming that the company was not illiquid, that it engaged in conservative strategies that were to work in both bull and bear market conditions, and that, quote, business was operating as usual at Vault. That's why a guy like me, who, who had withdrawn $200,000 on June 13th, I redeposited that $200,000 on June 24th, I believe, uh, to my dismay. And the reason why I did that, Your Honor, is because received, we had received, not just me, others. I know of one top top 10 creditor who said, like me, he took out over $2 million. He put it back in after receiving all these false misleading emails from Darshan. And the reason why we have been asking for their financial reports at that time is to prove, as it will be proven, eventually it will be proven, and we hope to get uh, some financial uh forensic accounting done here through hopefully judicial uh, managerial oversight to get those documents because they are not providing them. Why? Because they're trying to come up with some other solution to save face. It's obvious. But regardless here, Your Honor, uh, sticking to the facts, the fact is, is that when they claim in their most recent affidavit, uh, I have all the references I can supply later. When they claim now that they were aware and have let us know that they were in trouble in June, okay, but the fact of the matter is they also claim that a large part of what drove into their financial problems was the collapse of Terra Luna. Your Honor, the timeline is incredibly important, sir. The fact of the matter is, and they're avoiding disclosing this, Terra Luna collapsed in May, in early May. So if at that time they were already losing millions of dollars, they lost upwards of $28 million of Terra Luna, they were already insolvent, they were already illiquid, Okay, our questions to ask, when did they engage in counterparty A's loan, which purportedly seems to be sometime in June because its maturity is coming up again in June 2023. Those answers have been uh, ignored. And so the reason why we're asking these questions, Your Honor, is not out of non-relevance, it's exactly relevant. Why would the company be, when it's already illiquid or facing uh, liquidity issues, why would they take all this money out of the stash and put out a big loan to another company and hold up liquidity for one year. They cause the liquidity problems, but they keep blaming market conditions. At the same time, they stated that they had conservative strategies that work in all market conditions. Your Honor, the, way, the reason why we believe them, and now we feel completely betrayed, is that as others have stated, Your Honor, they have very clearly stated on their site in multiple places, which I have referenced in, in a report, that they engage in 150% collateralized loans to borrowers, both institutional mm -hmm. and, and retail. Mm -hmm. And we had no idea they were taking our money and investing uh, speculative trading, going long Bitcoin and XRP. So they they never disclosed to us their trading activities, which is uh, definitely a violation in the US and other places. Uh, and secondly, um, they're now blaming market conditions on the asset liability gap and saying that it has to do with the market when it no, it's it has to do with their decisions to engage in speculative trading. Now right. we're to believe sorry, that, Mr. Durfler, I'm afraid I've got to try to move on to would you be able to wrap up in a minute or two? Yes, and on the fund manager option, where the segue is to that, sir, sure. is by that pattern, they're now the next scheme is for them to try and take our funds and get an external third party fund manager to do the same thing, engage as others have said, gambling with our money in a highly speculative market, okay? Uh, we don't want that, we will fight it. And the reason being, sir, it's not just on principle, which is you have to realize the principle is incredibly important. None of us signed up, none of us signed up. We signed up with a lender who, who was gonna lend out our funds, earn yield, and then we get paid based on fixed income. And uh, I'll wrap it up by one of our, uh, Jared, who is our administrator for the user group that he started up after the Telegram chat I got shut down. He has made some cogent points, which I will paraphrase as follows. Uh, illegalities enforcing fund manager option on USA citizens. Per legal advice from at least one USA creditor, the fund manager option introduces two legal issues as follows. Number one, investment products need to be registered with the SEC for non-accredited U.S. investors in a fund manager situation. Number two, it is illegal to force U.S. citizens who
who signed up for a fixed income product to then convert their assets to a speculative fund without the express consent of the individual. Said consent is not provided via group vote should the individual not vote in favor. Your Honor, I understand that if the scheme gets voted and those opposed to the fund management option are in the minority, it still will be an illegal act of use of their funds and it will be challenged. Uh, on that point alone, uh, by them, by the by, the lawyers that we've heard from, Ong and others, claiming that the Nexo deal was dead because they're not favoring U.S. Uh, customers, are pulling out. We can make and are making the same argument regarding uh, this Ill illegality of forcing U.S. citizens to go into a fund manager without our consent. Oh. So there's many, many other reasons why we don't support the fund manager. Well, many of us do support, uh, including myself. Uh, to get this in the hands of the court right away. We also, uh, meaning through the IJM, uh, Independent, uh, or I should say Interim Judicial Management, which thank you, Your Honor, for providing more detail on that earlier. Many of us have put, been pushing for legal representation, so we know how to proceed in that matter to properly apply to your court with the proper paperwork, not to threaten lawsuits. We want to get this moving forward per your rules and regulations. So thanks for the guidance on that. It helped many of our members understand the process a bit better. In uh, winding up, sir, uh, there's um, uh, we want action now. Uh, we do want Darshan and, and management to step down. Uh, no one yet has spoken to the $500,000 a month burn rate, which went down to 350 to the $300,000 burn rate. We estimated close to $3 million of operational costs have gone right. so, and spent. All right. So, Mr. Darshan, I'm afraid I'll ask you to end. Any last word? Yes. That's that's uh, th that is it, sir. The, we we want action now because right now we're paying for all these lawyers. We're, we our funds are being used. We appreciate the process needs to be followed, but we need action. And some of us will fly out to Singapore to get action. Thank all you, right. sir. All right. Thank you, Mr. Uh, last one, Mr. Uman, Mr. Robert Uman. Do we have Mr. Uman? Yes, thank you. Mr. Uman? Sorry, Mr. Uman, your video is off and so is your audio. Uh, your Honor, can you hear me? Oh, yes, sir. all right. I can hear you, but uh, see you. are you able to switch on uh, the video? The video is disabled on my device let me very quickly turn it on um and zoom sorry sorry for that that's right all right uh mr Uman, i'm i'm very uh Clock's ticking, but uh, I'll let you uh, proceed by video, uh, by audio only for the moment. Carry on, please. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Uman, are you there? All right. Uh, oh, have we lost Mr. Uman? All right. Yes. All right, Mr. Uman. Right. Thank you. Carry on. Hello. Sorry. Yes, that's all right. I fell out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I, uh, I I will keep it very brief. Uh, um, what I'd like to mention, I think it's it's clear that uh, every creditor wants to get as much funds back as possible and as fast as possible. And uh, for everyone to afterwards decide what they want to do with their own uh, um, with their own funds, whether that be choosing someone else to manage their money or um, manage money themselves. And uh, I feel things are being made uh, very complicated by vault management. And um, the argument that in a liquidation, only 16 to 29% of the funds 
will be re recovered um, uh, that doesn't make um, sense because the risk of uh, the still outstanding funds, for example, to counterparty A and other ones, the risk of those funds not coming back is equal, is equal in a uh, fund management scenario as well as um, in a managed wind down scenario. Uh, so that, that risk will remain there. But afterwards, uh, if we would choose for a managed wind, wind down scenario, there would be no further risk uh, in terms that every individual creditor can do with their money what they want. And uh, although the fund uh, vault is claiming there is a projected 100% recovery, there is zero guarantee on that. Uh, and I see that as a huge risk that is not addressed properly, whilst at the same time, vault management is claiming that under a liquidation scenario, only 16 or, or up to 29% is being re re recovered, uh, which, well, it, it, it doesn't make sense because the risk of funds not being returned that are still outstanding is equal under any scenario. And Your Honor, if I may ask you, um, I, I, I wonder if it is possible if you can order a vault to, uh, to process a managed wind down under uh, the moratorium scenario uh, so that they are protected from lawsuits and claims uh, whilst being able to have the highest chance to recover the outstanding funds, uh, which are at the moment around 70% uh, of the liabilities. And I see that as a much simpler solution, uh, whether uh, instead of making it so complicated to go through a managed fund that will still uh, keep us with, with vault and the funds for an additional three years. Uh, so as I am, I am under, in essence, in support of a moratorium as such uh, to recover our funds safely, but I do not support uh, the fund management, as I think many people with me, as that exposes us to additional risk, which we don't have with a, man with a managed wind down. And um, well, thank you for your time. And I hope you will be able to take that into consideration. Thank you. Oh, all right, thank you, Mr. Uman. <clears throat> now, before I turn to Mr. Ong for his responses, uh, I think there are a couple of things I need to also mention. Um, I think unlike uh, the law in other countries, I generally can't insert a kind of trustee or someone into the company in a moratorium type uh, situation. It's, uh, doesn't quite work that way. I, I can suggest it very strongly. I can make it perhaps a condition for extension of the moratoria, although that's uh, not quite tested under our law. Uh, as far as I recall, uh, I can strongly suggest, but I can't uh, displace the uh, management directly in that way. Uh, that's really something that's catered for the judicial management process. That's when they get displaced. Uh, secondly, there is no uh, duty on the company in, a, in proposing a scheme to put multiple plans or alternative plans. They could if they wanted to, I think, but they could choose not to. There's no obligation. They just put up what they can put up one plan. It's an up or down vote. If it gets through, they're happy. Uh, if it gets voted down, uh, that's it. There's nothing else necessarily follows from that. Uh, it may mean that the company will be in trouble and it can't rescue itself. But uh, if the plan is voted down, we're basically back to square one. They don't have to put up alternative plans. They don't have to put up plans that are uh, the kind of thing that uh, uh, creditors might feel uh, being an option is up to them to choose. But there are things I can strongly suggest, and I will come to that uh, in my directions at the end, if I'm persuaded by Mr. Ong to grant the moratorium extension. So I just wanted to flag that for everyone's consideration at this time. Uh, then let me turn to Mr. Ong. Mr. Ong, your response, please. Uh, yes, grateful, Your Honor. Uh, and thank you for the comments uh, from, from, from the attendees. Um, I'll try to be as comprehensive as possible. Uh, there were questions asked in relation to whether the fund management option, if it's presented, uh, would be twinned with a reverse touch auction, which would allow an early exit option uh, to customers. 
the short answer is that as covered in the uh, the ninth affidavit uh, and also presented previously uh, at the town hall on the 26 December slides, um, that is the plan, uh, which is to twin uh, the fund management option with uh, the reverse Dutch auction, which would allow for an early exit. So in short, for those customers who wish to achieve an early exit at a haircut, uh, they, there would be opportunities to do so for those who wish to uh, remain invested through uh, an independent fund manager, uh, they can also choose to do so. so sorry, uh, so Mr. Ong, you're confirming that there will be an exit mechanism under the scheme that will be put forward? Uh, that is what has been uh, proposed, yes. Your All Honor. right. And that's okay. actually covered in, in the All affidavit. Right. So, so um, for the record, could you uh, specify the paragraphs for the affidavit so people could look it up easily? It, paragraph 37 of the ninth affidavit, Your Honor. All right. Yes. Um, right. Carry on. Yes. Uh, as to, I, and this is a point I think we had touched, uh, or various uh, individuals have touched on. I mean, uh, the wind down uh, uh, option uh, that actually has been addressed uh, at paragraph 40 of the nine affidavit as well for the benefit of the attendees uh, as to why it might well be quicker uh, as far as payouts, but the realization would be very low. Um, and in any event that I think um, as requested by one of the attendees, uh, I think it's fair that, you know, that analysis as to the pros and cons of liquidation versus wind down versus RDA twin with a fund management option, all of which, um, you know, the pros and cons of each and the analysis, detailed analysis as to each uh, ought to be conducted by the company and presented uh, to the creditors. Uh, so that I think is the company's plan in terms of uh, presenting the, the the analysis to to the creditors, um, we we hear the concerns regarding the governance structure in relation to the fund management option. Uh, we'll convey that to the company to see whether there are any uh, governance mechanisms that could uh, address those concerns. Um, we. Uh, here also concerns regarding the profile of the fund management managers and the fees. Uh, again, as I alluded to earlier, uh, the discussions with the uh, shortlisted fund managers are ongoing. Obviously, this will be taken back and, and conveyed that the creditors have concerns on the fees. Uh, and as to the identity, uh, at some point, obviously, uh, they and their profile uh, would have to be presented to the creditor body group to satisfy them. Uh, that they are indeed firstly credible and to uh, what their strategies are and so on and so forth. Um, there were concerns raised regarding uh, uh, suggestions regarding misrepresentation of uh, financial position and asset and liabilities uh, pre-filing uh, of uh, uh, these proceedings uh, in July 2022. Um, I can't personally comment on those. Um, other than to say that in so far as assets liabilities uh, snapshot position is concerned uh, from July onwards and until even in the 8th or 9th affidavit, the asset liability position has been uh, set out. Uh, uh, confirmations on oath has been made that there have been no withdrawal since. Uh, and I think there was a request for a breakdown of the assets by uh, each and every token. Uh, that's now uh, been provided in the nine affidavit at page 130 for reference uh, and as, as, as requested uh, by, by, by uh, uh, certain members of the audience. Um, um, we note the comment regarding the liquid legality issue as to the fund management option. Um, you know, that's something that we will convey to the company to consider. Um, and in terms of uh, the issues regarding distrust, mismanagement and alleged misrepresentations. I, do, I think that this is not the appropriate forum to, to, to address that. I think if there were specific, then as alluded to by some members, uh, that should probably be the subject matter of either a liquidation application or an interim judicial management application. Um, I think those uh, precede the time of the uh, filing of the proceedings. Um, certainly, I think in, 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 in the fund management option, uh, it is it is understood and appreciated by the company that there are governance concerns and conduct concerns. 
um, and that's the driver for preferences as to the wind down option. Uh, there is also uh, uh, that will have to be addressed necessarily by the company if they want to uh, persuade the creditor groups that the fund manager option is a viable one as to how um, the uh, management of DeFi is dis disassociated from, from, from that proposal or that structure. Uh, those issues will have to be addressed. Um, I think well, I hear I hear the uh, complaints, continue complaints regarding communications. Um, I think we've taken on board uh, the the judges' uh, suggestions regarding the email grouping, which I think in some part has also been addressed by the creditors themselves with the VoteCreditor.net uh, groups. Um, I think there has been uh, feedback, uh, mixed feedback, uh, but certainly I think in terms of communications in December, January, when things were more crystallized, uh, the, there has been a significant ramp up on, on, on communications uh, and, and town halls and so on. And that obviously has to be accelerated if there's any prospect at all uh, of the uh, proposal uh, being uh, properly brought before the creditors and considered by the creditors. All right, Thank anything you. else? Oh? No, Your Honor. Uh, all right, I can express I have some concerns. Uh, let me deal with these uh, in turn. So I've given a suggestion or strong, very strong uh, indication that the COC ought to be expanded to 25 in a way that brings in uh, both uh, some of the smaller account holders, especially from India. Uh, but also, of course, ensuring proper representation for other levels, uh, especially in the US. I think it's primarily US and Europe. Um, so if I would require the company to provide an update on this to me by way of letter in about two weeks time. Similarly, in two weeks, uh, whether a email or otherwise uh, some communication space can be set up for the uh, account holders to just communicate with each other with uh, no moderation and well I know that there'll be uh, a lot of uh, unhappiness expressed with each other I think it's important for the all the account holders based on the reg registered emails to be able to communicate in this way and they can reach out to each other in whatever the way they can, but I think they need to have this forum. Yes. Uh, as I indicated, the chat will be distributed uh, to everyone. What I will also in addition require is the company to provide an outline of uh, the proposed uh, voting mechanism and scheme meeting plan even ahead of any uh, formal application because I think it will be quite uh, compli a complicated process and I like to see the company's thinking on this so this can be provided to the court only by letter to would uh, two weeks be all right, Mr. Ong, or you require more time for that? Um, I think this one, it might require more time, Your Honor. So maybe three weeks by the 10th of February. Three weeks, 10th February. All right, just an outline so I can eyeball it and see what uh, concerns might come up. Yes. All right. I would, just, uh, despite what I said, about acknowledging the limits of the Borton process, ask the company to consider whether a orderly wind down can be put forward as an alternative. Um, I appreciate that the scheme is intended, sorry, the moratorium is intended for the company to consider what plan it can put forward uh, as a going concern. I do wonder whether in the circumstances there's really much point to that. And maybe what the best that can be achieved is an orderly wind down without the expense of a liquidation. So 
it might be worthwhile for those in control of the company to consider whether actually there might not be much point to having a fund management uh, situation if there's a likelihood that quite a few creditors would just want to exit with a haircut. Maybe that should be considered and could be put forward as an alternative plan. Uh, I recognize, again, that uh, uh, under the law, this is uh, something for the company uh, to choose in its own uh, discretion. Uh, but I think when it comes to the scheme approval, that might be something that weighs on my mind, subject to arguments. So Mr. Ong, uh, could the company just consider me? I, I do wonder whether there's any real uh, point to trying to survive. Yes, I, I, I hear, I hear. All right, you. All right. maybe it might be better this way. All right. Now, turning to the creditors, uh, I know some of you have uh, given a lot of thought, put in a lot of effort. I received your letters, I do have them. But what I strongly suggest is that because we're heading towards a scheme, Proposal at some point on the, the on the basis of an extension today, we got to start planning for the eventual hearing. I suggest you keep your bundles of documents together and be prepared to put it into a form that will be uh, transmitted to the court if need be. All right, I'm not encouraging you to send me huge bundles, but put whatever you have together uh, on hand. So if I ask for it, uh, you will have it handy, and we don't have to try to scramble to put everything together uh, when it comes to the actual hearing. Now, again, as we are coming, we seem to be heading towards a scheme proposal according to Kami, uh, coming up in April thereabouts. I would strongly suggest for those of you who feel strongly about the situation and have the means to consider whether you want to retain lawyers so you can explore your options and whether you should instruct lawyers. I'm not encouraging you to oppose, but I'm just saying if that is your decision on advice to put up a formal uh, position in court uh, through lawyers, whether it's to ask, for example, for appointment of judicial manager instead or to petition the court for permission to proceed with a liquidation, that kind of thing. All right, so because the moratorium is in place, you have to ask for permission first to proceed with whatever you want to proceed. So, but that requires an actual legal uh, application process with documents and that kind of thing. All right, and, and then you've also got to think about the actual legal process you want to initiate, assuming I give you permission to proceed. The other option is of course to ask me not to extend the moratorium, but uh, usually the lawyers tell you they'll try to take uh, some of the things uh, all together to make it uh, more efficient, all right? But I'll, what I'm trying to say right now is start thinking about whether you want to instruct lawyers and whether you can afford to or whether you need to consider it. There are, there are pros and cons. I can't go into it with you, but it's something for you to consider. Again, I emphasize I'm not encouraging you to do this, but I just want to highlight that because of the way things are lining up, uh, if you want to do this, you may have to do it to be ready to do so uh, ahead of April. All right. Now, the final thing is a uh, video will be put up uh, in a couple of days uh, time once we get everything sorted out uh, on the usual site, All right? So you can highlight this to those of your uh, fellow account holders who have not been able to join us uh, this morning. Now, Mr. Ong, <clears throat> looking at the law and the submissions, uh, I think I am of the view that the threshold uh, has been met for the moment for some extension, but I am not going to grant you the full three months. I am amenable to ordering this if everything pans out. My concern is really whether everything's really going to pan out in the way you've indicated. So what I will do for the moment is to grant an extension only to the end of February uh, with a hearing in mid-February for you to come back and let me know that you have indeed finalized the term sheet with the uh, one of the fund managers and you are heading towards a scheme. And at that point, I will want to check it on the various things that have arisen. All right, Mr. Ong, 
Yes, Your Honor. I'm grateful for that. Thank you. Uh, you can indicate to your fund managers or whatever, what, whatever other investors that I am amenable to extending it to beyond end of February to April onwards, uh, if everything seems to be panning out. All right? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. So let me uh, work out a few things. Uh, let me bring up my diary. So the end of February is 28th of February. So extension only to the 28th of February. Uh, hearing for extension to be made before then. I will specify a ARPTC to be held end of January to line up uh, the, the appropriate filing dates. All right? Yes, Your Honor. All right. So as I indicated, I will be amenable to further extensions uh, to April if the arrangements line up. But what I must emphasize to the company is that I do not see this as a situation where there will I will be easily persuaded to grant extension after extension. Uh, I don't think this is the kind of case where that will be productive. And it will take a lot of persuasion to uh, convince me to extend uh, really much beyond April. All right? Yes, Your Honor. I think, I think at some point, uh, the company has to weigh its chances and it may be that if things don't work out as planned, actually maybe a liquidation might be the best scenario after all. All right, I remain open to hearing arguments, but I think that's what's on my mind. All right, Mr. Ong. I appreciate that, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, so therefore, subject to the amendments I've indicated, order in terms of prayers, uh, one, one, but only up to first, uh, sorry, the 28th February, uh, and order in terms of prayer two as well. That's all you need at this time? Yes, that's all, Your Honor. I'm grateful all for right. that. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. I hope all those who are observing today and uh, the creditors who may be seeing the video in a few days think carefully about what I've highlighted and be aware of the broad parameters of what I indicated might be possible in the moratorium application, the scheme application, and how that compares to judicial management or liquidation. Uh, and again, I emphasize, I'm not trying to cover all the bases on this. In this case, I'm afraid I cannot do that. Uh, that unfortunately is not my role. Uh, there might be things you want to explore with your lawyers if, and with lawyers, and you might want to consider that. Uh, I will have to leave you to, uh, weigh what is in your best interest yourself. All right, with that in mind, uh, thank you everyone. As I said, the video will be put up uh, in a couple of days and I will arrange for the webinar chat record to go uh, around to everyone. All right, thank you. And nothing further. All right, call is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>